Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Twenty-five individuals, including two current senior White House officials, were granted security clearances or access to national security information despite recommendations to deny their applications. This according to a list made by an employee of the White House Personnel Office. Trisha Newbold, who spoke to the House Oversight Committee in a private interview where they identified her as a whistleblower. The New York Times reporting, quote, Ms. Newbold told the committee staff members that the clearance applications have been denied for a variety of reasons, including foreign influence, conflicts of interest concerning personal conduct, financial problems, drug use, and criminal conduct. The denials by career employees were overturned, she said, by more senior officials who did not follow the procedures designed to mitigate security risks, which fits with previous New York Times reporting where we learned the president ordered Jared Kushner's clearance despite objections from intelligence officials. From that report, quote, the clearance had been held up in part over questions from the FBI and the CIA about his foreign and business contacts, including those related to Israel, the UAE and Russia. That's according to multiple people familiar with the events. Chairman Cummings also wrote a letter to White House counsel Pat Cipollone increasing pressure on the White House to cooperate with his ongoing investigation into the security clearance process. In light of the grave reports from this whistleblower and the ongoing refusal of the White House to provide the information we need to conduct our investigation, the committee now plans to proceed with compulsory with a compulsory process and begin authorizing subpoenas starting at tomorrow's business meeting. Everyone is still here. Chuck Rosenberg, this seems like, this has long felt like the looming national security crisis, that the people in charge of these background checks are blind to partisanship, they're blind to nepotism. Um, you usually don't have to say that when you talk about the White House Security Clearance Office, but in this case you do. They render judgments that in most normal White Houses are the last word on these background checks, clearly not so in the Trump White House. That's right. We ask nonpartisan professionals to do the background investigations. We ask nonpartisan professionals to adjudicate those investigations. Look, I've been through the process many times. It can be maddening. It's laborious, <laughs> right? It takes a long time. And by the way, in, in, in every administration, there are people who fall out of the process, right? They can't mm -hmm. get through it. The red flags go up, they're told, and they politely and discreetly walk away from whatever job they were hoping to get. That said, it's also not unusual maybe once, maybe twice, uh, to clear somebody who might otherwise have difficulty because they are, they're uniquely talented or they have a particular exp expertise. But 25? That's extraordinary. And it continues to show, I think, by this administration, a disdain for the normal processes of government, which in this case can be uh, dangerous to our national security. And let's be honest, I'm sure this wasn't your issue, but mine was college drug use. And the questions that hold up an application for added scrutiny are usually not foreign contacts. They're usually not red flags raised by the CIA. They're usually some report from a college friend that the FBI knocks on the door in interviews and they ask you if, you know, did you answer all these questions? I mean, let, let's just be honest about the scope of concerns. They usually aren't red flags from the intelligence community. Right. They're usually more minor. And by the way, whatever your issue or other issues may have been, <laughs> Nicole, you answered honestly. I did. 
<laughs> to Robert Mueller, no less. But that's another well, story for another but, day. <laughs> but, but you answered honestly. And answering honestly is a big deal because if there is an issue and it's a minor one, answering dishonestly excludes you. And answering honestly means that you can be cleared. And so what we want to know uh, about your credit history or your criminal background or your drug use can always be mitigated. And people with minor nicks and dents can get through the process. But to your point, extensive foreign contacts and particularly extensive foreign contacts that you fail to report that is a deeply troubling trend and those types of people should never be cleared by nonpartisan professionals they needed to go another level higher they needed the politicals to weigh in and to overrule the nonpartisan professionals and that is dangerous And Robert Costa, because my mother might see this, it was just marijuana, but let's keep going. On the Trump White House security clearance question, Republicans, when they controlled these committees, had concerns. There were flags raised inside and outside the White House that caught the attention when these committees, which became very political in the first two years of Trump's presidency, were run by Republicans like Trey Gowdy. This really seems like um, an Achilles heel. You've also got um, Trump loyalist Don McGahn, Trump loyalist John Kelly, who were so troubled by the practices around the security clearance process that they penned memos to the file around what they viewed as abuses. It's a significant development to have this whistleblower who was inside of the process, because as reporters, we have been biting around the edges, searching for answers for over two years, trying to figure out why were some of these security clearances blocked? What did the president say when he made the decision to override those decisions? Was it just about college drug use or was it something about foreign context? And getting context for the foreign context, it's critical to understand what was actually happening with these clearances. Now that Congress is getting some answers, some some fresh answers, maybe we can understand more what was the president doing when he waved these clearances through? How significant was that decision? And Aaron Blake, your colleagues, yours and and Robert's colleagues at at the Washington Post have been on this since the earliest days of the Trump presidency um, in July of 2017, reporting why Jared Kushner has had to update his disclosure of foreign contacts more than once. Um, Also writing about Kushner's overseas contacts, raising concerns as foreign officials seek leverage. Jared Kushner has been... um, Uh, I I don't know what's beyond a red flag, I guess a flashing um, purple flag with a siren since the beginning. Yeah, and Chuck talked about how this process can be frustrating. It can take a long time. Uh, I think that the general consensus with Kushner is that it took an exceedingly large amount of time. Now, the question from there was, was this just a symptom of the fact that this is a guy with a lot of different business interests, a lot of different international ties that needed to be uh, figured out? Uh, We don't really know the answer to that question. We also don't know whether this whistleblower was referring specifically to Jared Kushner in some of the things that we found out, but it's not difficult to draw those conclusions. I I think it's also important to put this in the context of everything we've seen over the last two years. This is not the first time that the White House has been reported to be doing things with its information that seem to pose potential national security threats. We, of course, had the president talking with Russians in the Oval Office, giving them classified information. Uh, Michael Flynn being kept in the White House after they were told for a couple weeks that he might be compromised because he had lied to them. Uh, The president self phone use, the idea that the Russians and the Chinese are actually listening in uh, to the president when he's using an unsecured cell phone. There are all kinds of these things that point to kind of a cavalier attitude towards uh, national security in certain ways when it's not very convenient for them. And a lot of that flies into the face of what we saw from the president when he was campaigning against Hillary Clinton, of course. The big news today, though, is that this is way more than Kushner, right? This is 25 people, and this is systemic in that the White House, officials within the White House, political officials, are overruling and changing longstanding protocol and forcing career people uh, like this to to basically make approvals that they've said should not yeah. be made. And, Nicole, this is something, just to be clear, that has been bipartisan concern. Mm-hmm. For two years, the Democrats and Republicans on the committees on the Hill have been writing these letters trying to get more information, and they've essentially been stonewalled. You're seeing it now because the Democrats are actually acting on it, but this has also been a concern for Republicans as well. 
It is Tuesday, the 2nd of April of 2019, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Now remember, a scant dash of smoked hot Hungarian paprika will make all the difference in the world. It will. Just a scant dash. All right. Well, at the top, <laughs> that's that was a rundown on 25 security clearances that should have been denied. Whistleblower Trisha Newbold uh, brought forth that revelation, well, actually corroborating what we suspected, not the sheer number, mind you. We knew Jared. We knew Ivanka. We really knew Jared. But 25 individuals. Now, it has come out uh, in the interim amount of time since that clip uh, was posted. And now (laughs) the administration is coming out. A spokesperson or someone said, yeah, yeah, there was 25. But there's only five with really serious problems. Only five. And it's just serious problems. Yeah. You mean CIA? Serious problems? Hmm. Does seem that maybe America is compromised now, doesn't it? And the hearings will go on, and they will go on, and it will take some time. Even with a subpoena. I mean, it's not like on TV where you issue a subpoena, and then that that night you're knocking on the door. No. You get the subpoena issued, or well, apply for the subpoena. And it may take until, I don't know. (laughs) That process could take quite a while, Bunce. A year? You never know. It does at times. So uh, we are in a big drag-out fight for sure. And, uh, wow, in other news, did did you hear what Trump is saying about Puerto Rico? That they're not showing the proper fealty to him? He's the best thing that ever happened to Puerto Rico? Yes, I, I guess he's the best thing that happened to Puerto Rico because he's pretty darn intent in getting rid of all the black and brown people there. Even if he gets to use a storm to wipe them off the face of the earth. The only reason he's upset, he's not upset because he's being blamed for the deaths in Puerto Rico. He's upset because the storm didn't kill everybody would have made it a lot easier on him now he has to do some kind of work and he hates work yeah oh and what is it that they say about uh cheat at golf cheat at life Mm -hmm. well there's that too well we already knew that trump cheats at golf i mean god he cheats on his wife's wives which means he's also cheating on his mistresses too i mean a cheat is a cheat Cheats at taxes, cheats at business, probably cheats at pinochle. God, how dare he? He could sit right across the table from you with the steely eyes. No. And he's on your team. Yikes. (laughs) Yeah. Well, what's on the rest of the menu today? Because we do have a day. Well, In the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, we're going to look at Homeland Security's domestic terror unit is eliminated by the Trump administration because, well, it's just not a priority. Yeah, I bet. Now, this comes on the heels of uh, white nationalists being the number one cause of domestic terrorism in the United States, and now they have eliminated that intelligence and analysis unit, it's just not a priority. Probably because he needs more brown shirts, and that's where they get recruited from. Gorsuch handed down the most bloodthirsty and cruel death penalty opinion of the modern era. Yeah, you don't have a constitutional right to no pain when they torture you to death. Wow. Times have changed. I guess elections do matter, except when you have a recalcitrant traitor running the Senate who wouldn't let Merrick Garland even get a vote. And now we're the obstructionist. Isn't that weird? And environmental lawyers fight fire with fire as they adopt Alex legislation in a box methods 
to tackle climate change. Well, it's about time. We'll write the bills and you just put them in. Yeah, they're going to stop that now. You won't be able to have legislation in a box because now the liberals are doing it. After the break, we move to the chef's table where the U.S. women's soccer team say their lawsuit is about more than money. And two Republican state attorneys general urged a federal appeals court to uphold Obamacare. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. You will notice the chat room link at the right edge of the page. Go ahead. Click on it. Kelly Lincoln is there monitoring most of the time. And there's other people there, so you can uh, engage with people in real time, as you know, chat rooms do. Or leave a message and we'll get back to you and uh, do. So please do engage. If you would then take a gander. Yes, yes, yes. I am intent on bringing back ancient languages. If you would just take a gander to the leftish of the page from the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you will notice the contribute button, and that is definitely uh, placed uh, because we are in more dire need than usual because we have to save some money to get equipment. We've been eight years on the air and, uh, the broadcaster hasn't been on that long because we've had to, uh, get a couple of broadcasters in the interim. <laughs> so let me just say it's a workhorse, but, uh, I'm keeping my fingers crossed, but the other, uh, laptop that we have uh, is uh, just about seven years old and it is uh, I'm inching it along put a new battery in or I'm going to put a new battery in hopefully that doesn't kill it <laughs> oh I hope not everybody says it's okay but I'm going to do that and uh, but we need to purchase that and we need to get a new broadcaster as well so thank you for your recurring patronage patronage of uh, netroots radio by rec by becoming a recurring patreon uh you know even just uh you know once a month if you could afford once a month a latte an espresso type coffee drink uh, send uh, those funds our way and uh, that really goes a long way to helping us mitigate these financial woes that seems to be uh, rather uh, common among liberal media, because in spite of what they say, uh, there's no Hungarian guy uh, helping us out. Uh, it would be nice. George, if you're out there, uh, we're working hard. Okay, so <laughs> thank you for your generosity. If you would uh, like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom will take care of that. And not only will, he has been and does. I take care of Justice Putnam at Justice Putnam. And I also post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. And uh, then get the links on social media within that little window, that 10 minute window. If you would like to follow the show on Twitter, do so at Cookbook West Pickup Podcasts of the show by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, YouTube, iHeart, iTunes, and really wherever fine podcasts can be found. All right, let's take a look at this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Uh, we have uh, a bit of weather here in, where the mothership resides in Southern Oregon. Actually true Oregon weather, the stereotypical Oregon weather of April showers bring May flowers. And it's quite loud, so I'm hoping that 
uh, the booth that I construct here. It's just a temporary booth. But I hope that it's uh, sufficient. All right, this first offering in the Bistro Cafe is by Travis Geddes out of Raw Story. The Department of Homeland Security has shut down a working group of intelligence analysts who focused on domestic terrorists and which has dramatically reduced the amount of information available about threats from white supremacists and others. Current and former DHS officials said the development has caused significant concern within the agency, especially as the threat from right-wing extremism and domestic terrorism grows in the U.S. and abroad. Hi, Steve Bannon. I wonder if he has something to do with this. The Trump administration appointed David Glaw to oversee the DHS Office of Intelligence and Analysis. And last year... He shut down the group that shared information with state and local law enforcement to help them monitor threats from violent extremists and domestic terrorists because they found out that a lot of the cops were white supremacists and, you know, recruiting is so hard now. Glaw then scattered the analysts to new positions within the department as part of a office reorganization. Wow. Talk about deconstructing the administrative state, Steve. Glaw insisted in a statement that DHS and its Intelligence and Analysis Office continued to share intelligence with the FBI, state and local law enforcement, and the National Network of Fusion Centers about potential threats, regardless of a threat actor's ideology. Well, I'll tell you. They're not hearing about the white supremacists, but if you're a black identity, they'll be looking through your trash. Next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terry Town Chowder Tuesdays is by the great Ian Milheiser out of Think Progress. Precedent? We don't need no stinking precedent. Boy, you know, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh and the rest of these right-wingers, the dream team, I suppose you might call them for, let's be clear, white nationalist right-wing uh, sentiments. Supreme Court's opinion in Bucklew and Presseth, which it handed down yesterday, Monday, on a party line vote. That means five to four. No more of these unanimous decisions. That's just quaint history. Is at once the most significant Eighth Amendment decision of the last several decades and the cruelest in at least as much time. Neil Gorsuch's majority opinion tosses out a basic assumption that animated the, the court's understanding of what constitutes a cruel and unusual punishment for more than half a century. In the process, he writes that the state of Missouri may effectively torture a man to death, so long as it does not do it gratuitously, or just to inflict pain for the sheer purpose of inflicting pain. We're not doing it for the sheer purpose of inflicting pain. We're inflicting this pain because we want this person to die in the most gruesome manner possible. Not gratuitously, of course. We're not pandering to our most basic animal sentiments. No, no, no. We have a higher cause here than just the sheer glee of torturing a person to death. State sanctioned, by the way. And on top of all of that, Gorsuch would conscript death penalty defense attorneys, the men and women who will often give up lucrative legal careers to protect the lives of their clients, into the ghoulish task of laying out the method that will be used to kill those clients. You are against the death penalty and you're defending a death penalty client. 
And the court says, no, au contraire, your legal representation, you get to choose the manner of your client's death. The one that you think won't cause the most pain. And even if you accept the premise as legal counsel to, with your death penalty client, choose the manner of death in which you think it might cause the least amount of pain. This Supreme Court now stipulates that, oh, contraire, you think that you want to go out with just being a barber tall or something that you know that uh, won't cause any pain? You have no right to that. No constitutional right to that. You can choose the manner in which you think you want to die, but we'll tell you how you will die. Looming beneath the surface is an even more ominous sign for anyone who hopes that this Supreme Court will not replace decades of established law with the Federalist Society's wildest fantasies. In several recent oral arguments, Trump appointee Brett Kavanaugh appeared unexpectedly sympathetic to liberal lit litigants. And Bucklew was one of these cases where Kavanaugh browbeat a lawyer defending Missouri's plans to potentially inflict tremendous pain during an upcoming execution. Are you saying even if the method creates gruesome and brutal pain, you can still do it because there's no alternative? The newest member Kavanaugh of the court asked at one point, and yet Kavanaugh did not simply join Gorsuch's opinion he wrote a separate opinion suggesting that, well, maybe death row inmates could be executed by firing squad as well. Monday's decision in Bucklew, in other words, is just not a sweeping rewrite of one of the Bill of Rights' core provisions. It may prove to be a very real window into the mind of Kavanaugh, and it suggests that whatever noises Kavanaugh makes during a hearing... He will ultimately be a reliable vote for whatever outcome the court's conservative bloc prefers. And now I hear they're holding up uh, a possible appointee to the court uh, until Rose Bader Ginsburg dies. I wonder if they want to do, do it the gruesome, ghoulish way. I'm sure they dream about it. Deaton of Nexus Media, by way of Think Progress, brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. For the last 40-odd years, the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC, has been a mainstay of the conservative movement and a major force in shaping state laws. The organization brings together state lawmakers and corporate leaders to draft business-friendly policies that are then ferried to state houses around the country. ALEC is a primary reason why Iowa, Oklahoma, and Louisiana, for example, have all passed different versions of the same law penalizing protests at oil and gas pipelines. ALEC's methods have been so effective in aiding polluters and so frustrating to climate advocates that a pair of seasoned environmental lawyers are now deploying the same strategy to tackle climate change. Michelle Girard, uh, or I'm sorry, Michael Girard, director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia U, and John Durbach, director of Environmental Law and Sustainability Center at Whit Whittener University, have published an 1,100-page compendium of policy ideas and they are organizing lawyers across the country to write laws based on the ideas laid out in the book, 
laws that can then be distributed, Alex style, to local, state, and federal lawmakers. It's a smart strategy because the easier you make the adoption of these recommendations, the more likely they are to get adopted. Now, let me cut to the chase here. Look, with term limits, there's a lot of dimwits out there who don't know anything about anything, and they think that they can legislate now. And if they take the job seriously, there's a lot of catching up to do. And what's the best way to catch up? You hire someone to crib your notes. Right? You hire someone to write your term paper. It's how it works. So it, it, we, we can't change their ways. We can't convince these legislators that you really should uh, know something about the bills you're writing. Or how about this? How to write a bill. It's not going to work. We don't have enough time. They get termed out right about the time they learn how to do it. And then somebody else starts in and doesn't know how to legislate. And uh, pretty soon the whole machinery of government grinds to a halt, which seems to be uh, probably the plan. Okay, but we don't want it to grind to a halt. Why don't we use their methods against them? We just have to accept the fact that there's a steep learning curve and we can make it easy on these legislators. And look, you can appeal to them and teach them but if it's all laid out and all you have to do is put your name on it well at least that's how Alec works which means as I mentioned before they'll put a stop to that because as soon as a Democrat does anything that a Republican has done it's bad and what's an example of that well how about the individual mandate from Romney Care all right, let's get to our break. And when we come back from that break, you know we are going to go through weather from around the world and finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. <laughs> From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, Jordan Peele, the new king of horror. Those expecting a sequel to Jordan Peele's hugely successful, darkly comic 2017 debut, Get Out, won't find it with his new one, Us. This one is darker and has fewer laughs, although the two movies do share a powerful message about the state of American society, namely the difference between the haves and the have-nots. Us tells the story of an affluent African-American family with the leads played by Winston Duke and Lapita Youngo as they vacation in Santa Cruz. The latter's character, Adelaide, is hesitant about the trip because as a young girl, she had wandered into a nearby funhouse and encountered another girl who was her mirror image. The encounter was brief but life-changing. As she tells her husband about the encounter, flashbacks show the young Adelaide diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, from which she never recovered. So when a strange family appears in the driveway of their vacation home and whose members resemble Adelaide's family, she believes it is connected to that childhood experience. To say anything more would move us into spoiler territory. Us shows that Peel is becoming a master at combining horror, dark humor, and social commentary, and he seems to be able to attract some of the best actors working today. In particular, Youngo is amazing in her dual roles. She has an expressive face and flexible body, and watching her play both Adelaide and her scary doppelganger is a feat to appreciate. Duke is somewhat underused in the goofy, all shocks dad role, but the child actors, especially Madison Curry as the young Adelaide, are amazing. While the conclusion may be puzzling, Us is nonetheless a solid entry in the genre and then some. At the very least, you'll never view red jumpsuits the same way again. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Touch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our page on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Steve Mursky. If you've ever called in a pizza order and then stepped out the door a couple of times to see if the pizza delivery guy was there yet, well, you've experienced Iktswarpok. 
It's an Inuit word that, quote, refers to the anticipation one feels when waiting for someone, whereby one keeps going outside to check if they've arrived, end quote. That's what University of East London psychologist Tim Lomas wrote in 2016 in the Journal of Positive Psychology. Itzwerpok was just one entry in his paper titled, Towards a Positive Cross-Cultural Lexicography, Enriching Our Emotional Landscape Through 216 Untranslatable Words Pertaining to Well-Being. Untranslatable as single words in English, that is. Other examples include the Georgian word Sheman Ajamo, meaning to be full but to keep eating because the food is so good. Bantu's Mabuki Mavuki, whipping off your clothes to dance. And Valdeinsamkeit, that's a German word for the mysterious and possibly slightly creepy solitude you may feel when you're in the woods by yourself. Early this morning, Lomas tweeted another such single word that covers a lot of meaning, Jayus, J-A-Y-U-S. It's Indonesian, and it means, quote, a joke so unfunny or told so badly that you just have to laugh, end quote. Why did he tweet that today? Check the calendar. And be filled with melancholy and world weariness. You know, Weltschmerz. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Heart disease and stroke can be catastrophic. They're leading causes of death, disability, and healthcare spending in the U.S., yet they're largely preventable. Alarmingly, heart disease and stroke are taking a toll on middle age adults 35 to 64, with over 800,000 deaths and hospitalizations in 2016. Million Hearts is a national initiative focused on preventing 1 million heart attacks, strokes, and other cardiovascular events by 2022. Coordinated actions by Million Hearts partners in communities, healthcare, and public health will keep people healthy, optimize care, and improve outcomes in populations at risk. Everyone has a part to play. Focus on the ABCs of heart health. A. Aspirin use when appropriate. B. Blood pressure control. C cholesterol management, and S, smoking cessation. To learn more, visit cdc.gov slash vital signs. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetRootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. When you go shopping, do you remember to look for the union label? On this day in labor history, the year was 1909. The American Federation of Labor launched its union label department. The goal of the new department was to promote goods and services made by union labor. Union labels today, often referred to as union bugs, have a long history, going all the way back in the 1400s. Some European trade craft guilds used visual symbols to represent their work. In the United States, the union label became more prevalent after the Civil War. The AFL sought to promote the use of such labels to build solidarity among the labor movement. It was also a way to promote the quality of union goods and services to the public. 30 years after the label department was launched, AFL President Andrew Green explained the importance of the effort. He said that a union label was emblematic of a high standard of living, of tolerable conditions of employment, of those conditions surrounding working men and women, which makes for a higher and better standard of living. In 1975, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union launched their Look for the union label campaign. Television ads and a catchy jingle helped promote the cause. 
Today, the AFL-CIO's union label department publishes lists of companies boycotted for not using union labor. They also produce a bi-monthly newsletter called Label Letter, which features information about modern-day union labels. All of these efforts seek to raise consumer awareness about the labor that goes into the items and services we purchase every day. It helps shoppers make informed decisions about how they spend their money. Labor History in Two, brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. I read the news today, oh boy. It's time for Nicole Sandler's What's News from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. Remember last week when Donald Trump claimed that his next move would be to completely invalidate Obamacare and that the Republicans would be the party of great health care? Well, never mind. Yes, Trump flip-flopped again. On Monday night, the president let loose with a Twitter rant in which he claimed the Affordable Care Act doesn't work, Republicans have a better plan, and how he needs his party to control the presidency and Congress to make it a reality before backing down and saying he'll wait until after the 2020 elections to do anything regarding health care. Trump also tweeted a threat to close the Mexican border in the wake of the ongoing migrant crisis. However, White House... Senior advisor Stephen Miller says Trump hasn't decided for sure yet, and we'll see how effectively the U.S. can handle halting, quote, meritless asylum claims from Central American migrants in the coming days. Trump couldn't resist bashing Puerto Rico again, this in the wake of the Senate defeating two disaster relief bills on Monday. Democrats were opposed to a GOP bill because of inadequate funding for Puerto Rico's disasters. On Tuesday, Democrats are set to introduce new legislation that provides funds for disasters in the Midwest in addition to Puerto Rico. In his Twitter rant, Trump went off on the island, calling its leaders incompetent or corrupt, lying about the amount of money allocated for relief, and arguing against more. Trump continued the barrage Tuesday morning, tweeting, The best thing that ever happened to Puerto Rico is President Donald J. Trump. So many people, but with such bad island leadership and with so much money wasted, cannot continue to hurt our farmers and states with these massive payments and so little appreciation. By the way, FEMA submitted a full report on just how much has been given to Puerto Rico, putting the number closer to $3 billion than the $91 billion Trump claimed. A whistleblower has come forward to say that Jared and Ivanka aren't the only individuals whose security clearances were pushed through after first being denied. CNN has more. This whistleblower, who Elijah Cummings calls a whistleblower, Trisha Newbold, does not identify anyone by name according to the memo that Cummings put out today, but says there were 25 individuals that she listed since 2018 who were allowed to get their security clearances despite initial denials by career officials who had raised significant concerns about their backgrounds. Now, according to this memo, it says this, according to Ms. Newbold, these individuals had a wide range of serious serious disqualifying issues involving foreign influence, conflicts of interest, concerning personnel conduct, financial problems, drug use, and criminal conduct. Now, she goes on to tell House Democratic staff and Republican staff on this committee about a range of concerns about the way the security clearance process works at the Trump White House. She said there's not adequate staff to review this. She said there's not security, enough security to look over the personal security files. Uh, She also says there's, quote, an unusually high number of individuals who get interim security clearances, who she said should not. She said these people who got interim security clearances were later deemed unsuitable for access to classified information. Now, on top of this, she claims that the White House retaliated against her. White House officials have. And she said that she was forced to come forward before this committee. Now, Elijah Cummings says that he does plan to subpoena in an individual, Carl Klein, who served as a personal security director at the White House. He plans to do that this week. Now, we have not heard back from Klein or the White House or any of those individuals, but we did hear just back from the top Republican on this committee, Jim Jordan, who calls this a reckless use of whistleblower information, says that Cummings is mischaracterizing Ms. Newbold's, uh, what she told the committee, and says these 25 individuals, some of them were, as he says, 
a, one was a GSA official who is a custodial staff. So debate going forward, but clearly the Democrats are mm-hmm. the majority. They plan to pursue this in the days ahead. On Friday, Attorney General Bill Barr responded to criticism of his four-page letter to Congress about the Mueller report by disputing the characterization of it as a summary. He said he'd release a redacted version of the report by mid-April, long after the deadline of April 2nd set by House Judiciary Chairman Gerald Nadler, who said his deadline still stands. Judiciary Chairman Jerry Nadler demanding Attorney General Bill Barr turn over the full Mueller report tomorrow or else face a subpoena. Nadler writing in the New York Times, if Barr doesn't turn over the entire document, the Attorney General, a recent political appointee, undermines the work and the integrity of his department. The growing showdown after Barr promised a redacted version of the nearly 400-page document by mid-April, well after Nadler's deadline. It comes as President Trump has declared total vindication. The collusion delusion is over. Tweeting today, no matter what information is given to the crazed Democrats from the no-collusion Mueller report, it will never be good enough. The White House called it all political theater, noting Barr is redacting grand jury material, which by law is secret. The Washington Post is reporting that Saudi Arabia appears to be buying silence from the children of murdered journalist Jamal Khashoggi in form of million-dollar houses and thousands of dollars in payments every month. The homes and monthly payments of at least $10,000 to each sibling were approved by King Salman in an attempt to, quote, make a wrong a right. And that's just a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler. If you appreciate these reports and the Nicole Sandler Show, I hope you'll consider making a contribution. My work is 100% listener supported and I can't do it without your help. Find out more at NicoleSandler.com slash donate. From UN headquarters in New York, I'm Luke Vargas with your World in Two Minutes. For the second time in a week, British lawmakers voted down four Brexit alternatives on Monday, further paralyzing the country 11 days before its planned exit from the European Union. Monday's votes were meant to find consensus for more mild alternatives, including Britain joining an EU customs union after Brexit. Another proposal called for Britain to mirror Norway by remaining a part of Europe's common market while still remaining outside of the bloc. Those measures failed by a margin of three votes and 21 votes, respectively, a proposal for the British public to vote on any future Brexit deal and one to seek a longer Brexit delay also failed. Conservative MP Stephen Barclay said Monday's indecision should persuade lawmakers to back a deal by Prime Minister Theresa May that's now been voted down three times. But that optimism was far outweighed by frustration. Ian Blackford of the Scottish National Party said Scotland still wants to remain in the EU and would soon make another independence push. While conservative Nick Bowles, who championed the common market Brexit proposal, said he'd tried and failed to find a compromise to avert Brexit chaos. I have failed chiefly because my party refuses to compromise. I regret, therefore, to announce that I can no longer sit for this party. Oh, Nick. Nick, don't go. Come on. The Bulls' blame may have been better directed at 33 members of the Labour Party who want Brexit to be put to another referendum and who abstained Monday on the common market proposal, something they'd ostensibly prefer to leaving the UK with no deal at all. The Brexit process may now be an extra time, but that hasn't stopped lawmakers from trying to wait at the clock in the hopes it plays to their advantage. Luke Fargus, the United Nations. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terry Town Chowder Tuesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 54 degrees Fahrenheit. 
uh, expecting a high of 60 or maybe 62 or 59. It'll probably be more like 60, 61. And it even feels right now like it will be uh, quite rainy all of the rest of the day because we are in April showers, bring May flowers. Some people have started planning a little too early, and uh, but they'll see the results of their error. Let's see, winds uh, right now are light and variable out of the southwest and will pick up out of that same direction in about an hour or less at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And then we'll shift tonight out of the south-southwest, continuing at that clip of 5 to 10 miles per hour. Rain today, bringing about a tenth of an inch of rain, turning to showers tomorrow, in which we're expected to have just about a quarter of an inch, and rain throughout, rain and showers throughout the rest of the week and through the weekend. Uh, looks like it is quite a bit of rain and not less then uh, a fifteenth of an inch, and it uh, looks like about a third on a couple of, a, of days of, of an inch of rain. So that's going to be a bit, and I, I think the trees, especially the deep-rooted conifers, will love it. And I've been begging for it, and I got my wish, and that's what happens. Don't You, you have to really be careful about what you wish for. Pollen is rated at none. I have no data for air quality. The daytime UV index locally is at 5 in the cautionary moderate range. Barometric pressure is falling at 29.56 inches. Visibility is down to 3 miles. And relative humidity is at 97%. Weather from Around the World is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. The guy just right outside of London proper, he's in London, but not for London proper. He is registering right now 47 degrees Fahrenheit with rain. Uh, Paris is 57 and cloudy. Rome is 65 and sunny. Kiev is 49 degrees and fair. Kabul is 66 degrees and mostly cloudy. Hong Kong is 68 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 42 and clear. Sydney, Australia is 65 and partly cloudy. San Francisco is 52 and cloudy. And New York, New York is 46 degrees Fahrenheit and fair, except for the small craft advisory on the waterways. So, uh, you know, hold on to your hats, and uh, it's a little brisk, so might as well uh, button up that top button. Hold on to your top hat, and uh, that is weather from around the world, brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. Carol of Reuters brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Terry Town Chowder Tuesdays. Members of the United States women's soccer squad have told Reuters that their lawsuit against the National Federation alleging gender discrimination is not just about wages, but also improving the sport for women participating in it at all levels. All 28 members of the squad were named as plaintiffs in the lawsuit, which was filed in federal court last month and says that the women were not paid the same as their male counterparts. And let me remind you, and I'm sure that they specify in this article, the women have won the championships and the men haven't. Back to the article. While the men's team have voiced their support, the U.S. Soccer Federation has said it was surprised by the lawsuit, with its president, Carlos Cordero, saying it strives for equal pay and has boosted its investment in female player development programs. Yeah, well, pay the people that are playing now, in this reporter's opinion. 
Midfielder Megan Rapinoe told Reuters in an interview timed with Equal Pay Day on April 2nd, that's today, that they were also pushing for systematic change. For us, it is really important to really look at the bigger picture of the compensation piece, she said. I don't think you can talk about compensation articulately or intelligently until you have a conversation about funding across the board. So whether that is youth teams or staffing for each team or promotion and sponsorship, advertising for both teams, I don't think that is equal yet. So yes, we are fighting for equal compensation, but we are also fighting for this larger piece of investment in both programs equally. Since the lawsuit was filed, some companies have stepped in to help close the pay gap. Nutrition snack company Luna Bar on Tuesday announced that it would give each member of the squad a one-time payment of $31,250. That's the difference in the bonus paid to the men's World Cup squad who haven't won any championships. And sportswear company Adidas also said if the women's team win the World Cup this year, the Women's World Cup, its sponsored players would receive the same performance bonus payments as their male counterparts who win or lose the championship. Did they mention that? The women said the lawsuit would not distract them from their efforts to win back-to-back World Cups and a fourth title overall when they compete in France in June. Success for us is very simple, and it is very clear from the first second that you get on the team, whether it is like a passing pattern or a small-sided game or a friendly or a World Cup final, it's winning. It's competing to be the best of your ability. It's trying to be the absolute best that you can. So for us, the expectation is always the same. Success for us looks like winning, and it looks like winning a World Cup. And in this reporter's opinion, again. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière. La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux. Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, restez. Toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. Brendan Pearson of Reuters brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Two Republican state attorneys general yesterday, Monday, urged a federal appeals court to uphold the Obamacare federal health care law, saying that striking it down would be disruptive for patients, doctors, insurers, and employers. And I might add the whole world economy, but that's just me because I'm a romantic. The attorneys general of Ohio and Montana submitted friend of the court briefs to the Fifth U.S. Circuit, which is which is expected to review a December ruling by U.S. District Judge Reed O'Connor in Fort Worth, Texas, striking down the ACA, popularly known as Obamacare, derisively known in some circles, I might add. Dozens of patient and healthcare industry groups, including the AMA, the American Hospital Association, American Cancer Society, Senior Advocacy Group, ARP, also filed briefs in support of the law. And the briefs come less than a week after the Department of Justice, in an unexpected legal maneuver, said the entire health care law should be invalidated because Trump was exonerated of all collusion. It was a hoax, and now you will be punished. See what he did to Puerto Rico? He's going to try to do to you. You just know it. 
And that really does bring us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. Now, you know that Netroots Radio is going to be broadcasting on because that's what we do for eight years, 24-7, 365. We're a powerhouse of resistance, so continue listening to Netroots Radio. We're going to meet up tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesdays because that's what we do. We got a daily special every day of the week for you. And tomorrow, it is highly special. <laughs> so do tune in. And stay tuned, uh, continuing all day and all night on Netroots Radio for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver